Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the afternoon of our autumn disruption event here at the Disruptive Media Learning Lab. So this afternoon, I'm really pleased to welcome Anthony Anaxaguru. He's an award-winning poet, a playwright, a performer, and an educator. He's published eight volumes of poetry, a spoken word EP, a book of short stories, and he's written for the theatre. His poetry has appeared on various BBC programmes over the past decade, whilst also featuring at the British Urban Film Awards and BBC Six Music. In 2016, his poem, Dialectics, was interpreted and performed by Cirque du Soleil in Las Vegas. He is currently the poet in residence in several London schools where he teaches poetry and creative writing while working closely with both the Poetry Society and First Story. So please welcome Anthony Anaxaguru. Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna project. This is what we get trained to do. Sorry to interrupt anyone's work. Is anyone, doing, uh, is anyone writing a very important dissertation? No, good. Um, all right, so uh, by the way, I forgot to ask Debbie, how long have I got here? 45 minutes, you're gonna kill him. All right, cool, okay, so we'll do, we'll do a bag of poems and then we'll have some space for questioning if you guys have any questions. Um, I'll start off with some poems are longer than others. Such is the way. Um, I'll start off with a piece that clocks in at around about four and a half minutes. Uh, it's called The Master's Revenge. And it goes like this. There will be revenge, but it will be different from yours. It won't involve blood or murder or deception. It won't turn sophisticated people to rubble, then call them underdeveloped, primitive and backwards. It won't need military budgets, fear, prejudice or gender oppression. It will be simple, uncomfortable and absolute. It will present itself calmly. There will be no screams. There will be no protests. Just this. You are the owner of all energy needed to destroy or create worlds. Within you lies the peace of Akhenaten, the vision of Imhotep. We can go further, the first messiah. You are the writer of knowledge, the keeper of truth. It's looking at you through the stones, in the history of the mountains and the DNA of the earth. You're there. This wicked narrative is new. It's evil and unwell. A thousand years ago, you were teaching them. They were lost, barbaric, never knowing the evolution of language, of culture, the influence you had, you still have, you must have, because you're far from dead. Listen to the speech the knowers, the ones who tell you to open pages and find yourself there. Reinvent the past, pay the oppressor little mind. Little mind fears genius because it knows your story. It knows about the old kingdoms and middle periods from Moorish Spain to Muslim medicine. It knows about African mathematicians and the stone cannon circles of Nabta Playa. It knows, that's why it denies, that's why it tells you to kill yourself. Death has many faces. If something is made ill, why swallow it? Don't accept it, renounce it and go back to before the chattel, the division and genocide before the white Jesus before the Crusades and the foreign religions that came with priests and swords discover the hidden world because history is self-serving self-fulfilling look in the armies look in the prisons look in the places filled with the broken the destitute the trampled on the us but not them look and see what happens when you become apathetic when revenge is just for radicals when you believe the story they tell you when your only weapon is a gun when your knowledge is obsolete when your woman is a bitch, when your brother is a threat, and your oppressor is your master, your standard, your ideal, don't ask for mercy, it won't be given, lock it off, leave it there, it's dead, it's done, the damage consecrated, the sickness, it doesn't work. So start again with just this. When they ask you for a beginning, teach them about the Grimaldi, about Menes and the First Dynasty. When they ask you about women, speak to them of Isis, of Hushepsut and Cleopatra. 
When they ask you about languages, refer them to Coptic and Western Semitic tongues. Explain how 50% of the Greek lexicon is comprised of a non-Indo-European language. Give examples. When they ridicule you for saying in it, claiming the word as being Jamaican patois, let them know that it's a contraction of isn't it, which is a contraction of is it not, which is English, not patois, is it not. When they ask you about war and peace, inform them that the word war comes from the old English where, meaning to bring into confusion, mention the golden age of Egypt, communicate the fact that civilizations which have experienced the greatest periods of peace have been matriarchal. Say that twice. Include the fact that 70% of Native Americans did not ever wage war with each other. Refer them to conquest, sexual violence, and American Indian genocide by Andrea Smith. Keep close to mind the Haitian Revolution to St. Levator and Dessaline. If they interject, calling you Afrocentric or a conspiracy theorist, reply with these names. Gerald Massey, Martin Bunau, Bouval, and Brophy continue. Discuss human nature, how we remain products of our environment, how we mirror what we see, how certain genes are activated or deactivated in our childhood, determining who will become later. Explain what you mean by white supremacy as a political tool to divide and undermine those who don't fit the aesthetic. Discuss Thomas Spence and the making of the English working class. Look at degenerate families in the US and Anthony Stokes. Speak of Palestine with courage. Declare that before the 15th of May 1948, Zionists had already expelled 250,000 Palestinians emphasize that people are not born bad, that before capitalism and feudalism, communalism was how we lived, not primitive, but equal. Do not negate your woman. There is more to feminism than her physical appearance. You may wish to talk about Simone de Beauvoir, Bell Hooks and Angela Davis, and then poetry. The spoken word that predates the written word, oral tradition, art and storytelling. Speak until the sun has risen and set a thousand times. Wear the crown that doesn't need a stolen jewel to shine. Assure them that you are made from love, that you speak from love, because that is from where you were born. Play them a song, read them a haiku, teach them how to dance. And many will laugh at you, and many will brand you insane. Yet when has madness ever really mattered here? Some will listen. Some will stay, and you will grow into friends, into solidarity, into the forever we dream about. So treasure your woman, treasure your man, and because we're all we have, peace is the master's revenge. So stand in the present, draw for the future, and shoot with all the ammunition of the past. This microphone is very bassy. Can we turn down the bass slightly? Is there, is there a sound engineer here? Oh, there he is. Thank you, Captain. Very much appreciate it. Feels like there's a ghost in my hand. Um, so who's still doing that dissertation? Is anyone still writing? No, good. <sighs> this stuff they don't teach you at school. Um, short poem or long poem? Tell me, man, this is audience participation. <laughs> Short poem. What's that? Oh, fucking long poem. Man. <laughs> Hoping you would say sure. All right. Um, okay. This is not a poem, and I am not a poet. When I'm unable to find a better way of saying that in 2012, 48 people in Great Britain were killed by guns and 120 women killed by the hands of their beloved partners. I am not a poet when I can't find a more beautiful way to say that no nation in the world imprisons as many members of its population as America does. That more black men in the US are incarcerated today than what they were during the peak of South Africa's apartheid. No, I am not a poet when I can't find clever words to illustrate the fact that before 2008, Nelson Mandela had been on America's list of most dangerous terrorists for over 60 years. That Cameron is a liar. That Cameron was a key member of the Federation of Conservative Students in 89 that hoped to hang Mandela, forgive me, because today I am not a poet and this is not a poem. When eloquent words fail me and I can't capture the struggle of the poor through the metaphysics of language that by the time Margaret Thatcher left office in 1990, the annual incomes of the richest 0.01% of British society had climbed to 70 times the national mean. And I don't know how I feel about the fact that key policy makers and leading civil servants have never had a job out 
outside of their politics, the same men who set the minimum wage with only 4% ever having worked in manual trades, of which 68% went to private schools. That is why this is not a poem, and I am not a poet, because everything I've ever written suffers the weight of its own futility when another mother comes to a workshop with a fresh black eye, when there's another empty seat in the place that James sat in last week, and when I ask the group where he is, their young eyes open wet, as if his coffin in that moment was being lowered into them. But you see... I can understand all this more when they cut funding to schemes that aimed at inspiring people previously inspired by crime and the insufferable dross of mainstream culture, private prison systems and prisons for profit. When young women are given more options than just be someone's girl, be someone's mother, be someone's silence. But you see, I've done it again. I've crossed themes. I've not followed traditional poetic form. And so I'm a terrible poet because how do I speak words in prison then tell a young black person they want kings and queens of lands whose names fall dead on their tongue? How do I return their history? How do I mention the Marriott excavation, she canted the op, and the skin cell sampling of 300 mummies? How do I show them pictures of skyscrapers before skyscrapers even existed? How do I do all this and then have them ask what part of the world I'm from? Why well, don't write poetry about 1974, Eoga and Kissinger, until I tell them that I am not a poet and nothing I can write will help dismantle this idea of race that we've become so attached to. Nothing I can write will include the importance of mitochondria DNA and the 99.99% of us that is identical that a BMP member most probably has more Asian and Arab in them than the mosque that they conspire to blow up that immigration isn't a choice that people don't come to the UK for great weather, hospitality and quality of life how do I explain all this and still retain artistic merit I spent days looking for a metaphor to put the Palestinian Nakba in until I found a home that wants the beautiful and prim and I opened the door and saw its contents ransacked, its family massacred and its garden on fire. From that day, I abandoned any hope of metaphor and accepted that I could not write poetry about this, that everything I tried to imagine had already slit its own stomach, like the afternoon I spent with a woman who had been raped and I asked her to capture it in verse. I asked her to use simile and alliteration until she looked at me and said, I don't know what those things mean, but I can tell you in a few simple words what it feels like to live with the Satan of your own heart. Poetry isn't for me. It's for people who can use words like odoriferous while putting red wine to the lips of their white skin and applaud the technical endeavour of a poem. It's wit, it's ingenuity, it's metre and form, not it's helping, not the ambulance siren that screeches from the height of its title. That is why this is not a poem and I am not a poet. Because I cried reading Douglas Dunn, Aaron Kalatka, Borges and Neruda. I cried when I went looking for female poets and found few. I cried when asked how many black poets Penguin had ever published and was told two. When my English teacher told me that language wasn't my strength, that my anger crushed my intelligence, that I should think about going and learning a trade. And I cried then too when I spoke to a group of young men about what it was to be a man. How we inherit this cancerous culture, how we inherit misogyny, objectification and the glory of violence while silently suppressing the sensual. These were all the hardest things to write about, to talk about and to live with. That is why I keep saying this is not a poem and I am not a poet because all of the above digress and ignore the rules set by the establishment. But all that doesn't matter because it's done now. You've come this far in listening. Endings are always the hardest things to write because the author knows that's the last impression the reader will be left with. So I chose the following wisely. We are made up of all the things that broke us just to keep us alive. Maybe I could have said just that, but I didn't because, like I said, this is not a poem and I am not a poet. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, miss. Oh, out of all the questions in the whole wide world, <laughs> how do you remember it? Uh, repetition, going over it. I, I always like what, um, what, what's the film? Good Will Hunting, when he says, how do you remember your phone number? And it's the same kind of thing. It's just the same way actors remember lines. You remember, you just sit in your, in your flat, going around in circles for a good week, um, and then it just sticks in your head. Yes, miss. When I was 14, 32, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, 
but I didn't start writing professionally till about five years ago when I published my first, well, self-published my first book. Question two from professionally, like when you're actually paying your rent with the writing there. Because there's a lot of people that write poetry, but when poetry is your livelihood, that's when I guess you make the transition into, if you don't write a good poem, you ain't eating tonight. So it's that kind of thing. Mm. Yes, miss? What's your favourite poem? Don't have one. Don't have one. I, I, I have po poems that I revisit a lot, and they range from kind of traditional formalist poetry to very contemporary stuff. Um, to music, music is a great kind of, you know, in inspiration, I guess, folk songs, things like this. So I think, I don't think there's, um, film. Film is great, photography. These are all, I find poetry in all those things, so they all act as a kind of muse and a stimulus, yeah. Yes, sir. What inspires me? Everyone, I guess, people have an, uh, a kind of a misconception that art comes out of an epiphany. I don't think that's the case. I think that you have an idea, and that idea usually comes from either something very ordinary or something very extraordinary. But it's something particular, and it takes time to recraft and redraft and recraft that thing until you whittle it down into something very concise, and you're able to articulate what is essentially quite an abstract uh, thought or thought process into something concrete and palatable. So that's kind of how I see it. I don't see it as like, oh, I'm walking down the street, boom, I have an idea, write it down, here's my poem. It's not, doesn't, it's, it's a long time. You know, one poem took me six years to write, uh, just to try and get it right. Hmm. Yes, sir? Uh, would you say you have like a predominant subject matter? Yeah, I'm very, I'm very fascinated with history, with politics, with education. Racism, I think, is my main... Uh, Obsession, you know, what, what the mechanics of racism, the history of racism, um, and then trying to find interesting ways to articulate what is essentially a very tenuous, sensitive, and complex subject matter. And that's kind of been my mission. And I think it informs nearly everything that I do. Even when I'm writing love poetry, there is still a he heavy element of politics to who you can love and how you can love them and the way in which you can love them. It's all political. I don't believe in non-political writing. I think it's complete crap. Everyone is writing from a political perspective. The fact that I'm up here on the stage is actually a political sign. So you can't be apolitical. Even that is a political stance. Hmm? Yes. Yes, very much so. He's a good friend of mine. We, we, we've done a lot of things together. Yeah. Okay, so we have a shorter poem now, because I'm dying up here. <laughs> Do you want a love poem? It's been heavy, and it's only what? It's not even... Yeah, it's afternoon time, and we're getting into the heavy stuff. All right. Something a little bit more sentimental. Who's in love here? Anyone in love? Two people. Wow. <laughs> Miserable bunch. Yeah. All right. Here's a love poem. It's called Trying to Spell Love. There are some things the mouth finds increasingly difficult to spell. There are battlefields within us where nothing is able to grow, where our past and its ghosts search tirelessly for a warm place to die, where the white flags hang over the funeral of God and our limbs become the mirrored skyscrapers that attempt to intimidate the sky. Desperate in our touch, reimagining love through the ephemeral saints of class and gloss, we live away from the center, stagnant in our wandering while drowning in the pace of twisted currency, the pace of liquid alcohol hammering our dark veins, driving us further towards the flanks of despair. Lonely spirit drinks alone, hunched talisman, timid soul. Pictures of the beautiful, shared with a styled loneliness, waiting and wanting for the great ship to return, discovering the beginning through the very fear that propels the end, for love will only know itself through vulnerability and needing the body to shake like a collapse and say, hold me here in the places where it hurts, where they shot me down and left me to die in the same mud banks that coal diamonds and forests. Listen. Hard for the ringing of the dead bells, for the clap of the heart. I'm giving you my wounds because the hospitals are full and every doctor's hand is a raw coffin with the insignia on the walls becoming serpentine cracks. So please, bring it here. Bring a love without a past or a future. A love with nothing in front and nothing behind. 
One that's yet to be named as anything that could ever hurt. One as pure as the dream of an unplanted seed. As bright as the exact moment a newborn opens eyes to greet the world from the hot arms of its parents. A love that will walk back through your battlefields and help bury the bones that protrude from the earth of anguish. That will set sail along your scars, blowing kisses down their crooked river, moving with you as you learn each other's memories. Let hair grow over the part that pain owns. Place each each other's breath on the corners that burn and become the furtive balm that rescues the deep night from its galloping oblivion. Salvage each other. Let it all go back to where it's needed. Make peace with the waves and know that the moon tonight is pregnant with tomorrow's sky. There are some things the mouth finds increasingly difficult to spell. Perhaps that's it. Perhaps that's all anyone is ever doing trying to spell love with the letters of another's skin. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, when you were like, growing up, would you say that there was that actual kind of like, physical influence from your life, like a person who like, actually inspired you, not that you kind of yeah, I think the people that weren't supposed to inspire me inspired me. It was one of those ones where there was a lot of unsavory characters in the places that I grew up. And I always asked, you know, this isn't to uh, legitimize, try and legitimize drug dealing or any uh, form of um, illegal activity. But in rebellion, I guess, in rebellion, there's a lot of intelligence. And I guess that's what I saw. I saw a lot of people that were unorthodox and that were rebelling against the system that didn't cater for them or they didn't see themselves as being part of. And it was a very sophisticated process up until they got caught. But the problem was, was up until that time, they had a lot of intelligence that was misdirected. And I guess I saw that as a great inspiration in the sense of everyone has a potential. And somewhere along the line, something happens to a person for them to become a victim. And that is what the first, I guess, m thoughts of empathy and compassion started to, to build around. So, yeah, it comes in all different shapes and forms, but it's not a binary thing. You can't just see something, oh, yeah, you know. It's a strange, it's a strange thing. Uh, anything else? Yes, miss? Um, you do a lot of work with schools. Yeah. Well, first, they hate poetry, and that's understandable, um, because the way poetry is marketed is a very rigid, uh, hegemonic thing. I think that the idea is once they realise that there is an alternative, and there is a, a di an alternative voice that can speak to their cultural experiences and their sentiments uh, and their philosophies, it starts to become relevant. I don't want to hear the poet. Have you heard of the poet Adrian Mitchell? He once very famously said, the reason why people ignore poetry is because poetry ignores people. And that's part of the battle, is to bring it back to the masses, to the people who it was for. It became overly intellectualized in the 40s and the 50s, and then the beat poets kind of made it a lot more relevant and accessible again in the 50s and 60s. So it's kind of taken a turn now, and there is a whole bag of po poets that are doing very good, productive philanthropic things through their writing um, and communicating subject matters that people find very difficult to talk about. So I guess it has a grave purpose in, uh, in our society today. Yes. I haven't written poems. No, th th well, there's some poems that they use in class, uh, more word association things that are a bit more simple. And there's a poem that I'm going to read out at the end as well that has just started to get used a lot too. Um, shall I do one last poem and then we'll call it a D-A-Y? So I wrote this the other day. Um, it was a commission piece about the subject of immigration, which is what we're seeing a lot of at the moment. There's a lot of talk about immigration. I took a very um, a common refrain, I am, and I repeated that for seven minutes, and I wanted to see what would come out of that tangent. Um, and it's called The Journey Back Home. I am a locked door. I am a zip being pulled up on a tent. I am traces of water being wiped from the mouth. I am the sound of a headline being typed. I am the sound of a page being turned. I am from a time before the birth of God, 3.5 billion years ago when dust found life and chemicals inhaled each other pompous and brilliant while sunlight tackled starlight, arriving from some place beyond heaven. 
I am the first grace brushing hushed wasteland and new waters. I am the first fish feeling the sensation of a wave. I am the first bird chasing the promise of sky, cutting tracks through the cyclic geography of clouds. I am spreading myself slow like spinal roots, cracking through the body of soil. I am the first leaf dying. I am the sorrow rising from behind the sunset. I am 65 million years old, before borders were nailed into the hands and feet of Earth. I am a dinosaur roaming free the Arcadia of time. I am the first constellation being recognized by darkness. I am the first moon shifting into my corner of night. I am movement. I am 14 million years old. I am a season finding the knees of the first primate, which rustled the poised tip of some secret plant. I am the arm of confident bar. I am evolution, launching itself over all things unnamed. I am primate DNA, charged with the nitrogen of starving stars. I am prehistory. I am five million years old. I am a proto-human, arriving at the sonorous shores of existence. I am Australopithecus, settling along East Africa's Omo Valley. I am the strident rain, hounding the delicate calcium of bones, the prognathus of face. I am hominoid feet, darting to discover safety. I am the first feeling of phobia, but I move through. And so, I am the first valiant thing. I am the moment bones crunch for the first time. I am the first chimp to wage the first war. I am the screech to shatter to silence the first line to be drawn. I am inside reproduction. I am intelligence swelling. I am language in its infancy. And so I am metaphor and hieroglyphs and animism and worship. I am day and night. I am light and dark. I am above, so I am God. I am below, so I am devil. I am before these things. I am Osiris and Ra and Horus and Set. I am my art. And so I am Hinduism and Judaism and Christianity and Islam. I am the same thing. I am more and I am less. I am the death of light. I am the explosion of Santorini. I am a Minoan refugee being captured by a Mycenaean. I am the birth of Greece. I am a crumb being gathered. I am the skin Homer wrote the Iliad on. I am Pythagoras studying at the University of Waset. I am a black Egyptian teaching Pythagoras. I belong to everything which came before me and still I cut and fight and manipulate and distort to deny all that I am, all that is me, because today I am a skyscraper's window collecting rain. I am an E minor chord being strummed in Syria. I am the tabloid press. I am the last train home. I am a West End bar. I am a broken bell on a night bus. I am distance searching for home. I am a cold curb holding homelessness. I am a news report burning inside an explosion. I am the last bit of earth being patted down on a grave. I am a sticky hand searching for a girl's blouse. I am the sweat of a voyeur. I am sickness of mind and the terror of spirit. I am repetition. I am a frozen auto cue and I am live. I am a politician picking dirt from out my little finger. I am a room where war is signed off and where water jugs are refilled and the aircon never stops blowing. I am a famine in Ireland. I am a famine in Sudan. I am the opium being pushed onto the Chinese. I am Tony Blair in 2005. I am Rupert Murdoch now. I am a prayer in Calais. I am a wave goodbye. I am a sinking boat. I am a swollen ocean. I am a music concert in Paris and I am gunfire mixed with blood and diesel. I am a parked car in Lebanon. I am the number 147 on a Kenyan news report. I am a tired mind searching for nuance. I am a wheelbarrow dying of rust. I am a coffee shop in Highgate and beard oil in Shoreditch. I am a nod to a waiter. I am privilege and social media. I am the French flag flying. I am genocide and colonialism. I am selective. I am a protest march. I am Muslim. I am not radical. I am not a terrorist. I am peaceful. I will not apologize for the extremism of others. I am the KKK holding a flame to a crucifix. I am a clan member ironing his white robes. I am a Nazi soldier praying to a dead Jewish prophet. I'm a Palestinian boy tying up his shoelace. I'm a last minute goal. I am the roar of a stadium. I am the right color. I am the wrong color. I am not white. I am not black. I am invisible. I am a genius in Mumbai. I am a genius in the ghetto. I am a genius in my mind. I am a woman playing drums. I am a woman writing code. I am a man breaking down. I am a man breaking up. I am a soldier cursing his grip. I am a mosquito trying to suck blood from a gun's trigger. I am eyes looking outwards. I am eyes looking inwards. And I am going to live forever in your mind. And I will govern the banks of your imagination with the waters of my sewers. And you will shoot me because I am black and unarmed. And you will wish me dead because I am gay. And you will punch me because you think I am weak 
weaker and you will rate me because you think I'm smaller and then you will forget me and look for something else to hate because you've killed yourself so many times that history has dedicated an entire epoch to your ghosts but I will still be here in you until the day comes when you remember that you too were once a baby who gripped the finger of your mother and cried when you were left alone. You will remember how your mouth was once toothless and pure and a heartbeat was the only thing you needed to make you human. You will think of breast milk and the smell of your mother's skin and you will see how we share the same eyes, the same nose, the same mouth, the same ears. And then you will remain silent until your hate drowns itself in its own acid rain and your humanity will breathe in the sunlight of every summer that's ever happened. I am a child picking himself up off the shore of a Turkish beach. I am drinking tea with my father. I'm a Palestinian girl who's no longer just a Palestinian girl. I am a fishing boat that never needs to leave its harbor. I am an olive tree that grows. I am a house that remains. I am an open window in spring. I am nothing more complex than the bristles of a broom. I am a door unlocked and I'm falling into a million open arms. And our song can be heard from here to the beginning of time. We have arrived and you are, by the grace of our heart, home. Well, thanks for that. I enjoyed that. Um, I hope you guys did too. Is there any questions before we disappear into the great abyss? Yes, miss. What was the name of the uh, hold, hold on, hold on, cousin. I'm just saying to, to this lady here. Yes, and then we'll come to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, just that term is very powerful. Thank you. Um, it's, it's trying to find, I think with, with, with refrains and with repetition, it offers audiences a thread, especially when you're performing as well. And once you lock into a thread, it's very easy to follow. Um, and the I, that particular piece, I think why I wanted to choose I Am, is because it's the universal I. And the fact that it is so longed and, and kind of pushed out suggests that we come from a very, very, very long lineage of I Ams, of I's. And that's what I wanted to explore from literally the birth of the earth up until modern day, in seven minutes, I felt the only way I could actually do that was to link humanity to one eye and keep pushing, because we are all of the same thing, we're all inextricably linked. So I wanted to try and push that message forward through that one eye. But again, it depends on the, the purpose of the poem and the process that I kind of use to excavate what it is I'm gonna say and how I'm gonna say it. So yeah, it, it, that took a, a long time to work out, because there was a lot I wanted to say. I didn't have a lot of time. And he's a big subject, so I felt I am was the best way to go through it, yeah. I love the way you say excavation. Oh, yeah, excavation. Yes, sir, sorry. Um, I've got two questions. Number one, what is the main purpose of the, the poem or piece that Sir Kafuna mentioned? And two, how does it help people to overcome the negativity to positivity? And how do you like inspire people? So three questions. <laughs> Sorry, it's fine. That's the bonus question, number three. Um, so the point of that poem, th that was the first question, what was the point of that poem, right? So the point of the poem was to show, like I just said, how we are all linked and we all come from essentially one thing. We were all at some point immigrants migrating from one part of the world to another part of the world. So these ideas the, that we have that the media love to kind of push across about how, you know, People come from different parts of the world to, so, to exploit economic um, privileges of other countries is, is completely farcical. Um, and I wanted to, again, without being didactic, you want to try and cover as much as possible in, those, in that time. What was the second question? All right, so poetry, I got it. So poetry as a whole is, uh, is a great catalyst for conversation, for thought, um, for sensibility. And there's a lot of things that we have inside us that people find very difficult to talk about um, and to express. So I think poetry and art in general walks that line between the intellectual and the spiritual. And it kind of does both. So people can find themselves within that 
framework, and that's why people turn to art, you know, whether it be film, music, uh, paintings, theatre, for that, for almost like it's a panacea, a form of uh, something cathartic where we can see ourselves reflected in and our sentiments and our philosophies. And the third, the bonus question, what was it? Um, I'm not sure. I can only hope so. That is the idea, is that um, we're, we are all part of the same experience to an extent. So the idea is to try and find the humanity rather than the divisions in people and draw that in into something quite humane um, and delicate and extraordinary. And that's how I see the human experience. It's a fantastic thing that a lot of the time is portrayed in a very negative way because of the circumstances around us. Thank you very much. Um, I have some, I bought some books with me. If anybody would like to buy a book, I have some books here. Um, I bought up, I imported from London. Um, thank you very much for, for having me up here and for listening and for your hearts and for your time. Thank you. <laughs>